It starts now on BBC One with Fiona Bruce. Welcome to a brand new series of Question Time with around 100 local people chosen, as always, to reflect the electoral landscape of the country and they want honest answers to the big questions of the day. Tonight, we're in one of England's oldest towns, Ipswich in Suffolk, a county dominated by the Conservatives, though Ipswich itself has seesawed between the two big parties. And tonight, is Rishi Sunak's policy shift on climate change a winner with voters? Our voters here will tell us. What does the Russell Brand scandal tell us about our culture? And will the NHS strikes ever end? Welcome to Question Time. The Minister for Small Business and Enterprise, Kevin Hollenrake. He's been MP for Thursk and Moulton in North Yorkshire since 2015, a constituency that borders his boss, Rishi Sunak's seat of Richmond. Thangham Debonair got a new job this summer. She's rolling three tasks into one as Labour's Shadow Secretary for Culture, Media and Sport. The MP for Bristol West has another string to her bow, being a trained classical cellist. Ella Whelan is a journalist, commentator and author. She writes for the non-conforming Spiked online magazine and co-convenes the annual free speech Battle of Ideas Festival. Her 2017 book is titled What Women Want, Fun, Freedom and an End to Feminism. Matthew Side writes columns and features for The Times and Sunday Times and is a broadcaster and public speaker. He's also an author of seven best-selling books about performance, positive thinking and learning from mistakes. And in the past, he played table tennis for Team GB at two Olympic Games, no less. from Ipswich. Welcome to our panel. Welcome to our audience here. Great to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home. We are on social media as always. We're also on a podcast after the programme. Now, it's a brand new series. We'll kick off with our first question. The panel do not know what the questions are. They never do, though I'm sure they'd love to. Let's hear our first one from Kelvin Gray. Um, are Rishi Sunak's delays on net zero a proportionate transition or a desperate attempt to win votes? Are Rishi Sunak's delays on net zero proportionate or a desperate attempt to win votes? Kevin. Thank you. Um, well, what he hasn't delayed is our targets for 2030 in terms of decarbonisation or 2050. They're exactly the same He's, as they were. They have were. delayed them on 2030. No, they're not 2030. 2050. 2030 is the same target as it was uh, prior to his announcement. 2050 is the same target as it was prior to his announcement. So what do you it's mean it's the it's same target? There's been a delay with... No, it, there are some, some different measures he has changed, but not in terms of the target for 20. 2030 or 2050. What hasn't changed is the UK is number one in the G7 so in terms of decarbonisation. OK, Karen. Uh, and the fact we are, if you look at the Climate Change Performance Index, we're in the top ten and we're ahead of every country, most, almost every country, a major economy in the world, Germany, France, for example. Um, what Rishi Sunak has done is some uh, sensible measures in terms of things like oil-fired boilers so oil-fired boilers, if your oil-fired boiler had broken down in 2026, you would not have been able to replace it. Now, you'd have had to replace it with a, a heat pump or something like that. I, there's a property in my constituency I recently visited that had, had to be, undertake a deep retrofit to accommodate a, a heat pump. That cost £70,000 to make that insulation fit for purpose. It would have caused a crisis in the rental market. It would cause a cost of living crisis for many owner occupiers up and down this country. Those kind of measures are a proportionate response. There are other ways we can meet net our net zero obligations without uh, measures like that, which would cost many ordinary people, many people on low incomes, an awful lot of money. It's the right thing to do. And what will those measures be, Kevin? Because, as you'll know, I mean, Alok Sharma, who, of course, headed COP26 for the government, has made the point that if you're going to row back on some things, you're going to have to scale up on others in order to meet the commitment. And that's absolutely right. That's why we're investing in nuclear just down the road here. Size will see, of course, we're investing in that. Offshore wind... But that was happening already. Offshore... We, we are... Our plans for offshore wind are accelerating. We've got the, the number one, the, the first, the second, the third and the fourth largest operating offshore wind farms in the world. Uh, hydrogen is, again, we're investing. Small modular reactors we're investing in. So that a number of measures that will meet those obligations without it meaning for people hitting a cost of living crisis, which what would have happened. 
And when, when you, just to be clear, so when you say they'll be, you're still going for the 2030 target, when it comes to cars, for example, the delay on banning the sale of new diesel uh, and petrol cars will be pushed back to 2035. 2035, that's true. But the target for producing electric cars remains the same. That's what you're referring no, to. No, the target for decarbonisation, the target we have in terms of percentage reduction... OK, 19, even though you're 19, pushing 19, back 19, the ban. Absolutely OK, right. and you think you can do that. Absolutely. OK, Matthew. Well, I, I think there is a tension, if I may say so, Kevin, between what you are saying tonight, <laughs> that everything has largely stayed the same, the targets, and what the Prime Minister said yesterday when he described this as one of the most fundamental changes in British policy making of the 21st century. I mean, I, I, for what it's worth, think we should take a step back. And I don't think the problem is what Sunak said. I think it's an arguable case about changing some of the aspects of the transition. But the problem is very few people trust the Prime Minister or the Conservative government. You look at the response of companies to this, Ford and others, who say that they don't have any confidence in the sustainability of the policy that Sunak has announced. And who can blame them? Because when you think about this government, they keep changing their minds, not just on the transition to net zero, but virtually everything. Just take a step back and think of the last five or six years. Boris Johnson disavowed almost everything that was said by Theresa May. Liz Truss disavowed what was said by Johnson. Sunak disavowed what was said by Truss. And now Sunak is disavowing what he said about himself. Remember, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer when the initial policy was unveiled by Boris Johnson. There was a period, you might remember, during the... Was it called the mini-budget? When the Liz Truss, you're referring to. This is Liz Truss's mini-budget. When there was a premium that the market imposed on British government debt... And they described this, it's slightly pejorative, as the Muppet premium. If we're going to lend money to these people, we want to have a higher rate of interest. But we are really, in a sense, paying the price of that because we have to pay higher mortgages. And there was a talking of trust. There was a period <clears> during <throat> Boris Johnson's prime ministership when the proportion of the British people who trusted the British government was less than the number of people who believe in aliens. How are we supposed to have... Trust is a fundamental ingredient of democratic societies. We need to be able to trust the businesses that are going to invest in this country need to trust in the sustainability of government policy. And I think that is why the reaction... If I may say so, Kevin, this is why the reaction has been so strong. I mean, Ford did say that, that's true. They, they, and um, others. Um, well, Toyota is supportive of this particular announcement. Every, every major car manufacturer, and these manufacturers don't just manufacture for the UK, most of the cars are manufactured in the UK, many of them get exported to the European Union. The European Union's target for electric vehicles is 2035. This is totally consistent. We've got to move, this glide path has got to be smooth, otherwise it will cost our citizens, particularly the ones we were here, here to represent, which is not big business, of course that's important, big business, all businesses, but the people we're here for most are the people on the lowest incomes. You would agree with that, Matthew, and that's why the Prime Minister's made this announcement yesterday. Well, the Prime Minister's made this announcement, obviously hoping, assuming perhaps it's going to be popular with people. Let's hear what you think. There's quite a few hands up. Yes, the man here in the blue shirt. Uh, yeah, um, do you think Rishi Sonak is running scared that he's going to lose the general election? So he's, he's panicking and yeah. doing this instead. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from Kevin in a minute. The man behind you in the, in the spotty shirt. Thank you. Um, I think that it's, it's an uh, investment that has been spooked by this. Okay. I think, as Matthew said, we mentioned Ford. I think, you know, a lack of now short and medium term decision making is spooking investment. There are several other countries that are pushing forward and putting their foot to the pedal, and we're going completely the other way. OK, the woman at the back. Oh, yeah. What message do we think Rishi's turnaround says to local authorities across the country that are struggling with budget cuts and trying to transform their services and actually becoming kind of carbon neutral and trying to make everything green and clean? What does that send when we're striving so hard to do that and struggling when we do a complete U-turn in central government? OK, and well, let's hear from the man in the front in the white T-shirt here. Well, I think the big issue of trust is that we just didn't vote for them. We didn't vote for Sunak and we didn't vote for Truss, we voted for Johnson. And then once, once he left office, they, elect, they brought in two more prime ministers who we just didn't elect, which I would say isn't very democratic. OK. Ella. Well, the thing about Sunak's announcement is that it... I mean, Matthew's right, it sounds like it's... A, and he talks about this change of direction and it's meant to be... You know, people have... Particularly in the papers across the last 
well, of course, the last 24 hours have used the language of U-turns. But if you actually, you know, look at the detail of what he said, he's still promising, and I think, in fact, he's laying the groundwork for the pain of what not ze net zero will entail, but just on a kind of longer, a longer day. I mean, the fact he's gone out of his way to say that he's still very much paid up to the ideology of net zero, and he's still, you know, he, he, in fact, he actually literally said, this is still going to be very difficult for everyone. These are going to be very difficult times. So I don't buy this whole kind of um, newfound uh, care for the working man and woman. Um, I don't think that it, well, yeah, I just don't buy it at all. I mean, the fact is that this is trying to spin austerity, eco-austerity in a positive way. You know, they're, they're on the question of heat pumps, um, that there is, <laughs> there's been no recognition of the fact that you know, a heat pump, no, no matter whether it's brought in or enforced or whatever in this period or that period, takes a day or more to heat up a house, whereas a gas boiler will take, you know, an hour or so. That the kind of money that people need to, you know, thousands of pounds that people need to retrofit their houses and insulate and change radiators and all the rest of it. It's not, it's like the idea that people are going to find that money between now and 2030 or 2035. When the government has no plans to grow the economy, no big plans for changing, you know, an to, to create an abundance of energy, to invest in new innovation or anything like that. I mean, the government's climate change committee is open about the fact that the majority of the changes that are expected are going to be on individual choices and behaviour. I mean, they call it choices. There's, there's no choice in it for us. And not centred on what it should be, which is genuine uh, uh, investment in new innovation, new technology, finding new energy sources, whether that's nuclear, you know, you can't just rely on what you've already done. You should be building, I don't know, however many new plants, do something ambitious. But in actual fact, the whole and the, the political narrative around net zero hasn't changed. In fact, actually, Sunak had the cheek of saying, this isn't really political. And I think that tells you something about the way in which the discussion about climate change is had. It's meant to be this very sort of nice, we love the planet thing, which I don't think anyone would disagree with, by the way. You know, you don't want to, you're not some kind of coal-sucking lunatic. But it's not, it's framed as this apolitical thing that we all just have to sort of get along with, which is, by the way, the way in which they frame the economy as well. Well, it's just something that's going to happen to us and you don't, you know, don't worry about it. It's a bit like the weather. It will just sort of happen and we'll react to it. We should be reasserting that this is a political issue. There are political choices to be made. And at the moment, the government is prioritising its sort of net zero obsession over the quality of life and the future of working class families. OK, thank you. I'll come to you in a minute. I'm going to hear a bit more from our audience. Yes, the man there in the blue top. Um, I find the, uh, should we say, the commercial outcry about this change in policy a bit disingenuous because I think really it's more about the uh, the fact that they've lost commercial opportunity because at the end of the day, if it was a point in principle, they could do it off their own esteem. They don't need to be told to do these things. OK, so you think they're, they're crying wolf effectively? Well, I think it's just politicising it, to be honest with okay. you. The man at the back in the blue shirt. I think personally that they, um, they're not ready for uh, the infrastructure. They being? Uh, well, with the government or anyone. I think when you look carefully at it, there is no, there's not that many uh, proper electric chargers anywhere in the country. And I think that they realise that everyone at the moment is struggling. Even if you're on 100, 150,000 or even 200,000, you are struggling in this country. What, you're struggling on 200,000 yeah, pounds a year? Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of people have to pay a quarter of a million, 400,000, 500,000 for, for a house when they're young. So do you think the government's right to do what it's doing? I think he's being honest. I think he's being honest. And when you think about it, we're going to bring it down by 2050. Where does China end up? They'll still be pumping coal into the air. OK. So well, we're wasting our time. Woman here in the front in the glasses. Recently there were by-elections and the one which the Conservative government held was partially blamed to the, the public... Uxbridge and South Rice yeah, that you're talking about. disliking the ULEZ. And so, Which is the ultra-low emission zone yeah. that's been expanded uh, outside London. And so I wonder how anyone can find this policy as honest or actually with incentive to help working-class people's financial situations when it's pretty obviously just a response to that by-election win and a strategy and tactic to gain more points in the next general election. OK, let me take one more point. Yes, the man in the white shirt, then. Yes, the man in the white shirt. Yeah, the minister mentioned about £70,000 for a heat pump. And it won't have to no, be... No, no, not, not just for a heat pump. Yeah, it was for insulation, completely retrofitting okay. the house. OK, they've still got you paid in 2031, 
I'd like to know the Minister, what incentives or what provision are you going to put in place for, to help people pay this? It's 2035, but yeah. yeah. It's 2035, and you're absolutely right, and that's why the, the Prime Minister has said 20% uh, of the homes in the UK that are most difficult to insulate will never have that restriction in terms of buying a new um, off-grid boiler or a new gas boiler. So there will be some properties that are just, it's just not economic to do it. So I, I think in terms of the point about electoral <coughs> opportunism, I don't get that. You know, when Rishi Ch Sunak was Chancellor, he wrote to the Prime Minister then, back in 2021, I think it was, to say he had very great, grave concerns about the direction of travel in terms of some of these targets. So I think but he it, supported it as Chancellor, as well, you well know. As you know, Fiona, we have a collective responsibility as ministers. You, you can't speak out openly about some things you have concerns about. So when about. he said too many politicians in government's all stripes have not been honest about the costs and trade-offs, he's including himself. Well, at times you have to make compromises, there's no doubt okay. about it. That's the world of politics. Thank you. You've been very patient. So the question was about whether or not it's a desperate attempt to win votes. Yes, it is. And it won't work. I think Rishi Sunak is trying to make this election a referendum on net zero, and he's ignoring the fact <laughs> that climate change is a clear and present danger, which we will have to tackle. And we can't put it off. But also he's ignoring that the solutions to climate change are part of how we make our country and our world better. When we invest in insulating our homes, we bring down people's bills, we use less fuel and we make warmer homes. Labour would have been investing in insulating 1.9 million homes every year. We announced this policy two years ago. That's nearly 4 million households that could be warmer and paying less. It's also when you invest in the renewable energies of the future, that's where those great jobs of the young people in this audience, so many of them are going to come from. Those are great jobs. Why shouldn't we? be world leaders in wind, in tidal, in solar, in new nuclear, in insulation, whatever it takes. Why shouldn't we be first movers? Why shouldn't we be taking that step? Why shouldn't we be rising to the top and leading by example? Because this is actually going to bring down bills if you invest in tackling climate change, bring down bills, make our lives better, increase our energy security, create good jobs, and it's good for the economy. And now, in the meantime, thing, when it comes to, for example, people buying electric cars, as we know, yeah. electric cars are, at that. the moment, more expensive, and heat pumps are yes, also pretty expensive. Yes, let me deal with too. electric cars. There are some disingenuous statements being made about this electric car policy. People are saying, well, it's working-class people who are going to have to pay for these new electric cars. Let's be clear about this. The ban was on new petrol and diesel cars. Most people do not buy new cars. Most people buy second-hand cars and that was never going to be banned for 2030. So That's it's just not true. It's just not true that by, by moving this ban, it's going to benefit those people who would have bought a second-hand car. Anyway, but I, I just know this point. Would well, you mind? Please, please. <laughs> You've had your turn twice. I'll let you well, in once, after, once. Matthew. <laughs> What Rishi Sunak has done is he has put the interests of right-wing backbenchers ahead of the people of this country who deserve lower bills. He has put making Liz Truss happy ahead of your bills. She crashed the economy. She put your mortgages up. She put your rent up. OK. And, this, and... Is, this is the measure of a man who is so weak that he's more bothered about Liz Truss than your bills, and that's where we are today. And heat pumps. What about heat pumps? How are you going to help people afford heat pumps? Then? Well, heat pumps, we've said that we, we... That's a government policy which they've already failed to work out. We have said quite clearly that we would reverse what they've done on the uh, electric cars because we know no, heat that pump. electric Talking cars heat are coming down. What are you going to do heat about pumps. boilers and heat pumps? We will need to invest in the technology to make them more affordable and more accessible and more efficient, but they're not the only way... And not bringing a ban until then? And uh, not... Uh, we will... We will uh, at the moment... Hang on, hang on. Let, let's, let's find out what Labour policy is. What we're <clears throat> to do is we, we we know that this is a government policy failure to implement yes, their what, own the labor policy. policy i'm just trying to understand so by the labor policy on boilers and heat pumps what yes. is it so heat pumps we we would stick to the 2035 but so so there would be, there would be a ban on new gas boilers after 2035. That's Labour policy. We want to make sure that they're is it, affordable. Is that, is that what and you that said? gives us more time to be able to do that. What about oil so, Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I just sorry, want to be clear. Sorry. I just want to be clear. Yeah, yeah. So is that Labour policy that there would be a ban on new gas boilers after 2035? I think that's what you're saying. Um, I think that's correct, yes. But I'm really... But you're not sure? Yes. yes. OK. 
Well, I, what, Can what, I just... Uh, let's let Matthew back forgive me. I, I agree with a, a lot of what Thangam said. I, you know, I do feel that we, if I may say so, I think we have to transition. It's not just about climate change. The quality of fossil fuels are declining. When we used to get oil in the 1950s, we'd take the easy stuff from the surface, sweet crude. We got 60 barrels back for every barrel expended in the extraction process. Now we're drilling offshore, we're fracking. We're refining very difficult products like tar sands. It's very energy intensive. We're only getting five barrels back for every barrel expended. The price of a barrel of oil at the moment is $95. As this energy ceiling collapses, the energy we need to run civilization, this is why it feels claustrophobic and constrained at the moment. But we have to be honest, reinventing the fossil fuel civilization from which we have benefited from 250 years is massively difficult, complex, expensive, intricate supply chains of the rare earth minerals and elements that we need to source in order to build the renewable infrastructure. And what I found disappointing about Thangham's answer is, is it, it made it sound like sweetness in light. Mm. This is going to be a piece of cake. I did. Electric fit, wonderful. We're going to get new jobs. We have to be honest yes. and prepare the public for the short term. But even the Climate Change Committee said that the net cost is going to be with us until 2040 something. And the benefits will the benefits accrue almost immediately in terms of cheaper energy. Wind energy is the cheapest form of energy generation there is. We know so the more we invest in it, the you more we a... which is why we also need to invest yeah. in new nuclear, Come in on. tidal, we in wave. And you know this. And if we're not going to, if we want to get to net zero, we should be world leaders in those industries. Why not embrace the fact that those are good okay. jobs, they're warm you, homes, and it's a future for our economy. Here, I want to hear more from Look, Briefly, you know, Anna. I kind of have to pull rank here as Plummer's <laughs> daughter, but, you know, the whole thing about people get obsessed with heat pumps. The whole, the whole reason, the whole idea with heat pumps is that it would raise the temperature of your house to whatever tiny amount, four to five degrees or something, so that your, then your gas boiler could kick in and do the heavy lifting of, you know, it was, ne it was always meant to be in conjunction, at least that was it began as, and now it's meant to, the narrative around heat pumps is that they are the sort of saviour, bin all the boilers and we'll all live off heat pumps. I mean, you know, if you've, <laughs> if you've tried to heat a house with a one-year-old, as I have, you know, you know that you need to have heat quickly, cheaply, and, you know, you okay. need to be able to do it fast. But just on the thing of, you know, the innovation question, I mean, at the moment, we are not matching up with reality. You know, you can sack a load of people in Port Talbot and it looks very green because you've enacted some kind of policy there. But when you talk about retraining people in a new green industry, what does that mean? What is that industry? Is it sending people to build wind farms? You know, that's not a new, you know, heavily skilled uh, sort of new green industry. There is no innovation going on here. There is no big picture. It's just, oh, let's rely on the wind. There's nothing wrong with, not with solar energy. There's nothing wrong with wind powered well, energy. Put up wind farms wherever you like, as far as I'm concerned. But there has to be a bigger question around nuclear and around not ditching fossil fuels immediately because it okay. makes politicians look let's, good. Let's, hear, about energy let's hear more from our audience. The woman in the front there. Yes. Um, if we're using so many renewables, how come energy costs aren't cheaper? And I believe that the government could do a bit more and force these developers to put more energy efficient materials in homes. Why aren't houses being built and it's stipulated that they all have solar on them when, when they're built? That's something easy the government could do. Why aren't we doing that? That's an easy fix, surely. I will come back to you on that, Kevin. The woman behind you. Um, <clears throat> I think the government is being entirely disingenuous about its interest in green energy altogether. It's my understanding that the government invited tenders from offshore wind providers very recently, yep. and all of those companies went to the government and complained because a cap was set by the government on what could be charged as a maximum yep. per unit of electricity. And all of the companies said that the cap that the government was imposing made it entirely financially unviable for them to be able to pitch for a tender. So all of those tenders were withdrawn and it collapsed. If there was a genuine interest in green energy, why did the government not set a reasonable and sensible level? And further, all of those companies have said that by the time the opportunity comes down, comes round to actually pitch for those again, the cost of any wind energy will have gone up because the manufacturing costs of the turbines will have gone up by that point because of the supply chain issues. So I don't think the government has been remotely interested in reality and that this is one large marketing exercise before the next general election. <laughs> do you want to answer that point about, yes, about the wind turbines? Totally. Because, because yes, she's, you're absolutely right about the cap. Yeah, that, the, uh, the process by which that, the auction was done was something called Contracts for Difference. It's been very successful in previous rounds, which is why we've got the fourth 
largest offshore wind farms in the world. But what's that specific happened, point about those negotiations? I will, I will, uh, I'm trying to deal with that. What's happened over the last year, of course, has been inflation has spiralled out of control. And that's meant the, it, it is not as viable as it was to build an offshore wind farm at the same rate. Of course, then we have to look at that and, and do another bidding round to make sure we do get successful bids. But the UK is absolutely a world leader in terms of offshore wind. In and, terms and, of that point the, about the future homes... And, yes. And yes, about insulating homes and making You're them quite right. more heat efficient. exactly what the government is doing. We, we're moving to something called the future home standard. Progressively, we've made... I mean, you've scra scrapped plans for new energy-efficient targets of private rented homes, for example. Uh, I, well, I've talked about that before. Can I just talk about the new homes? That new home standard is still there. Progressively, we're moving to carbon zero homes, and that's happening over a number of years. To, we're doing it progressively to try and make sure that the price of new homes doesn't get out of reach of, of young people particularly, or people struggling to get in the housing ladder or to move up. But it's, these are the delicate balances we have to strike. Yes, we have said the rented properties. Previously, you had to be a EPC rating C or above to be able to rent a home by 2025. That would have caused an absolute crisis in the rental market. Prices for, uh, prices for rental prices would have gone through the roof. Many people would have... There'd been a huge shortage of rental properties. Absolutely the right thing to do. It's a pragmatic response to where we are. That target was never realistic, and that's why the Prime Minister's changed it. Or you could just yeah. build loads more homes. Oh, Thank you. We quickly just want to come let's, back Well, let's look at the five things that were on the little slogan yesterday. There, there were things that weren't brief. even a thing. They weren't even a thing. So we have five things that weren't even a thing. So Rishi Sunak said, we're going to stop taxing meat, which is never a thing. He said, we're going to stop the seven bins policy, which was never a thing. So presumably he's going to use the seven bins that he's got a garden big enough to put them in to put his untaxed meat in. What was that about this not being honest? It is not being honest All to talk things. about things like seven bins and taxing meat and car show. Is he going to start putting his wife and his kids in All separate cars? Things. They were not things. And if they were government policies, they were government Government policies that you'd never really announced, you just made them up, or they were no. secret government policies. No, were you ever going to let on that having seven, bit, seven bins was a government policy? All those things. And taxing meat? All those things were referenced in the Committee of Climate Change. But they weren't government report. policies, so you can't in stop them. In 2021, they were in a report. You, you know. They were not government you know policy, the, as the you committee know, in the Kevin. Past has, Where's the honesty? Has, Where's the honesty? No, in the that? committee in the past has got what it wants from governments. They've just said yes, the we government. need to deliver it. What, what Rishi Sunak said is that no, we're not going to do seven those bins. things. We are not going to do those. Anyone here things. got seven bins? We're going to do what's no. right for the people. Okay. All right, listen, listen. But this is, if I may say so. Really quickly, so I've got to move on, take some more questions. Go on, Matthew. This is the quickly. problem. There was an incredibly powerful point made by the woman in the second row. The cost of building offshore wind turbines is going up. Why? Because they are embodiments of fossil fuels. They require concrete and plastic and steel. These are built through fossil fuels, the price of which is rising. The contracts were different. There were no auction bidders for offshore wind. If we're not going to be open and honest about this... and honest. understand, and un But understand the okay. explanation for why this right. is happening and okay. think about a strategy that okay. deals with it. But we're not getting there. It's this, it's this political to and fro, no, that's missing the bigger picture. Okay. And let's the let's stop the to and fro just for a moment. Trivial. Just for a moment. Because I... No, thank, you, thank you very much. I want to tell you, before we move on to our next question, others will never get any others in, and you did ask quite a few other questions, and I want to make sure I do them justice. Next week, Question Time is in sale in Greater Manchester. The week after that, we're in Wolverhampton. So if you'd like to come to either show, go to the website address here, and uh, you can apply. We'd love to see you. And actually, on that website is a list of, of all the shows that we're going to be doing for the next a few months, and you can see if you'd like to come to those. And also, I just want to say, this is a new thing for Question Time, if you would like a picture of your town to feature on the desk here, <laughs> as you can see, we think this is rather lovely, um, email us your best shot, your best photograph, uh, at the address here on the screen. Uh, that's cutiepictures at bbc.co.uk. I mean, we go all around the country, we might as well show where right, we are. Exactly. That's what we're thinking. Right, OK, let's take our second question from Karen, Karen Richardson. There you are. Good evening. Should Russell Brand's comedy antics have been challenged years ago? Right. Oh, there's a kind of mm, murmur from the audience. So you won't have missed this story, obviously. Um, four women have accused Russell Brand of rape and or sexual assault. Uh, the Metropolitan Police have also received a report of alleged sexual assault. The 6 o'clock news and 10 o'clock news uh, are also running a story about 
uh, inappropriate behaviour as well, an allegation from Russell against Russell Brand. I have to say, um, for legal reasons, and he is not here to defend himself, Russell Brand denies all the criminal allegations against him. Ella. Well, it's fascinating, isn't it, over the last sort of few days, you've had all these presenters and journalists and uh, politicians <laughs> saying, Jesus, who knew? I mean, I had no idea after listening to his hours of radio of being the most vulgar individual you could ever imagine, ringing up people boasting about his exploits, joking about assistants doing things with particular individuals. I had no idea that he was such a dirty so-and-so. You know, spare me. I mean, it's revolting, actually, to see the kind of fake mea culpas that are being published at the moment and the sort of chin scratching about how such an individual could be so charming. Um, you know, I, I made my moral judgments about Russell Brand a, a long, long time ago, and I'm sure a lot of people did. Um, whether or not you found his comedy funny, whether you, or not you found his sort of uh, self-help guru antics on YouTube interesting, uh, is sort of personal preference. Um, but I think the more the, the sort of the, the thing that's the question at the moment is whether or not he should be demonetized by YouTube. Whether or not you know the chair of the Culture, Media and Sport Committee, Caroline Dinage should be sending letters to video platforms, Rumble being the one, um, social media platforms threatening with the sort of weight and leaning with the weight of Parliament to suggest that they remove him. Because as much as I think I hope it's clear that I don't like the guy, as much as we don't like the guy, there is this thing called innocent until proven guilty. There is this thing called due process. And it doesn't take too big of a leap of an imagination to put Russell Brand and his you know, rich brat and his 6.5 million YouTube uh, viewers or whatever aside and imagine that it was someone else accused of something and imagine them, them losing their livelihood. It's the kind of the thing that irks me about this is the idea of faceless suits, whether it's in YouTube or less faceless suits in Parliament, suggesting, you know, imposing that they be judge, jury and executioner of a particular kind of moral quandary. Um, and I think that is a that is a big problem. So, you know, f f please, let's let's shame the people who didn't know how shameful Russell Brand was a very long time ago. But I think we should tread carefully when it comes to emboldening big tech to be able to make decisions about an individual. Thank you. So I think the there is a wider question. I mean, my view would be, yes, he should have been challenged. But I think wider than that is, so too should other people who use sexist and misogynistic values, behaviour, and impose them on other people. Now, that should be done in, through open debate. I think it's important, and I've spent 26 years before, before I became an MP working in violence against women and girls, I, including working with very violent men who had used sexual abuse. And the things that we had to do to try and change their behaviour and their ways of looking at the world, and, and we weren't always successful, um, was to try and examine how they thought, how they believed things should be. And where they often got that sense of justification and entitlement was from other men around them never saying, actually, mate, that is just not OK. And I think there is a bigger job to do here, which is changing the culture. Our entertainment industry did you, did is Did you ever predicated. get anyone to change their mind? Yes, we did. And we worked also separately with the, with the partners. These were usually ex-partners, people who had abused their partner or ex-partner. Yes, we did, not always, but we also engaged in sort of campaigning to try and work with younger men. I did that too. To try and get them to look at the issue of consent differently and sexual consent, what that means. But also, what is it, what's underneath this? What sort of attitudes are we bringing up our, our, our men and our boys with? Might we want different ones? Is it possible that the language Russell Brandt used is also being used by other men? Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement showed us, as do so many other recent high-profile scandals, that it's much, much wider than one individual and one organisation and one complaints process. I think we need to show, and I think non-abusive men in particular, you are a great force for good, you are the majority, you're the ones who can actually say, I would not want this for my sister, my mother, my, my wife, my daughter. You're the ones who can actually, more than we can, because women have been challenging violence against women and girls for some time now. We're pretty tired. And I really think that a non-abusive men, which is the majority of you, you also need to be part of that. And challenging that, whether it's one individual on a television show or it's a film producer or it's your mate down the pub, that's a big job of work to do so that these young women here have a different future because they shouldn't have to be the ones to stop it. It should be down to the individuals concerned and where it's not, it should be down to all of us. Okay. 
Yeah, I just wanted to come back on Ella's point about due process. I just don't think we have a system that we can trust at the moment. Last year, there was um, just over 67,000 reports of rape. Only 1.9% of those um, ended up in charges. And five in six women aren't reporting rapes. So we don't have a system that we can trust in. We don't have a due process that is actually... That, like that give safety to women. Um, so I just, at what point is there any accountability for, for sexual assault in the UK? OK, and the man behind you, yeah, with the glasses. Yeah, I think, sadly, it's dewy by social media. And I think social media has a lot to uh, answer for in cases like this. I think uh, I can only speak for me as a father of three daughters, my youngest daughter particularly. Um, you know, was approached by boys um, with photographs of their genitalia. And I think that is indicative, sadly, of society today. I think, um, I'm not sure what the answers are, but I think it needs a cross-party approach to actually get all of the law enforcement agencies together, women for domestic violence, um, looking at the CPS, the, the, the level of prosecutions for rape and other sexual offences against women particularly. But let's not forget as well that that can also be on men as well. And I think voices need to be heard, but social media has a lot to answer for and a lot to, uh, to say in this, I think. OK, Matthew. That's a really interesting point. And you know, Russell Brand is a great believer, is he not, in, in free speech? Should we not exercise our free... I believe in free speech, but I think we should exercise ours in saying that regardless of the criminal claims that have been made against him, which I think do deserve due process and uh, uh, presumption of innocence before the law, I think we should all say that he's a, a vile misogynist, a despicable misogynist. I was completely shocked watching this programme. Mm. I, I don't know how old I was <clears throat> in, in his kind of peak when he was on the BBC and Channel 4. I, I didn't know much about him. I don't know if anyone else it's in the audience was like... Yeah, I hadn't 2006, watched the Big Brother yeah. spin-off thing. I hadn't listened to his podcast or read his book. A lot of people are pointing the finger at the establishment. Fair enough. Maybe the BBC almost certainly should have done more. As I understand it, I mean, he, he was making jokes... By, of, he was employed by others as well, I just pointed sure, out. Sure, sure. But I think it's worth saying that you know, pillars of the media establishment should have done more to call him out, given on what we know and what he's written about and conceded to. And he said in that book, if I'm telling you this, imagine what I'm doing behind the scenes. But I do wonder, and this puzzled me enormously watching the, the documentary and reading the Sunday Times expose, is who was giggling along with the jokes about rape and choking? Who was finding that funny? Who was applauding? What did that say about our culture at that point, the toxicity of it? You know, I felt during that period that we were moving in a progressive direction. We're more female MPs, more women on boards. And I've genuinely, it's, it's been a, and on the social media point, you know, as, as a father, I worry about that a lot. And I, uh, you know, I hope I can mention hardcore pornography, very violent pornography that young people are getting access to. And I don't fully know as a parent how to prevent it because often young people are more sophisticated than their parents when it comes to accessing things of this kind. You know, social media is making our young people sick, mental health, I do, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a Ella, I know you're a libertarian. I feel the same way, but I do think regulation of social media is a, a pressing imperative today. The woman there in the um, white top with the stars on, yeah. Um, I feel like with the misogynist and the misogyny happening a lot right now, I feel like it is affecting the mostly the ones that are the most vulnerable to this, especially children and teens my age especially. Those people, the men and also the woman, who are now accessing the content as adults, their minds are already set on this. They can distinguish between right and wrong. Maybe they've already chosen to go down this path that what they're saying is right, that's up to them. However, people who may not know yet, maybe they're trying to find out who they are, they're getting access to this really graphic sort of disgusting and rude content, and that might be the new path they're taking, and maybe that's not the way it should be. Maybe we should be... Um, showing younger children, younger children and younger teens are more nicer and more supportive route rather than... Or more positive role models, yeah. you're saying. Kevin. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got to say, I haven't paid much attention to Russell Brand before it's happened this week. And then, uh, Karen, I don't know if you did you watch the Channel 4 yeah. documentary on it. It was, it, it was shocking. I mean, it, it was vulgar. It was disrespectful. One thing, it wasn't funny... There was nothing in there that I found funny at all, in the least bit funny. Um, I just don't understand the theatre putting like, something like that in front of an audience or the, or the promoters who would associate themselves with that. <clears throat> if I mean, whoever did see it, you might have noticed a comment by 
Bob Geldof on the on the uh, documentary, and I think it summed it up quite nicely for me. But um, what did um, he say? I can't possibly say, <laughs> but it was quite rude. Um, I mean, some some really important points on, in terms of uh, prosecutions on rape. Absolutely right that people need to have faith in the system. That is improving. There's been a threefold increase in the number of cases referred to the criminal the crime prosecution service. I mean, the numbers service. are still tiny, you know, <clears throat> Kevin. They need to be higher. It's absolutely right. There's been a, a two and a half fold increase of the number of prosecutions, which is exactly what we do want to do see. We want to see, but you're right, Fiona. It's not enough. Um, I think. I think in Matthew's point, I totally agree. I've got four children, including a teenage daughter. I am very worried about what they see online. We have uh, now legislated the online safety bill, which does, for the first time, put social media giants uh, under, you know, under the scrutiny and including cr potential criminal sanction sanctions if they don't do the right thing and don't control that content on their platform. It's absolutely unacceptable, the situation we are at the moment. OK, let me, I, I want to move... Can I just be really brief? Just Ten seconds. It's just that, on. you know, we move very quickly into a conversation about porn, which I think is worthwhile. But, you know, this... <laughs> If this happened in the 2000s, and it was institutions like the BBC or, you know, Channel 4, who are, you know, wag their finger constantly at us on a var variety of issues and see themselves as kind of moral exemplars, who were, you know, who knew what he was talking about, who actually hired him on the basis that he was this kind of salacious, ha-ha, <laughs> dirty guy um, who was, was meant to be okay. some kind of Lothario. So let's be clear about it. But the thing is, you know, in, the, in relation to rape stats... The reason why rape stats are so poor and rape convictions are so poor is primarily down to the police and the poor performance within the police. And we do not solve that issue by harming the process of justice, by damaging the idea of innocent until proven guilty. Like I okay. said, we can make oh, our judgments well, on you, you, You've made that point, Ella, thank you. Yeah. Let's take another question, because this is a very big issue for pretty much all of us. Chris Barrett, there you are. With doctors willing to strike indefinitely, what should the winner of the next general election do differently to resolve the doctors' pay dispute? And, of course, this week we've had, for the first time ever in the history of the NHS, consultants and junior doctors strike at the same time. And junior doctors are still on tri strike until Saturday. Thank you. Well, the first thing they should do is talk to them. I believe it's March since the current health secretary spoke to the junior doctors. I, I think it's the consultants, actually, in May since he spoke to the junior doctors. Now... These strikes have been going on some time now. You don't solve them by not talking. And we have a whole range of health workers who put themselves at risk during the pandemic and we clapped them and we applauded them, we put up rainbows, and, and rightly so. And what health workers tell me when I speak to them is that it is about pay, but it's not just about pay. It's also about feeling that they're not appreciated. And so well, Labour, I've heard Labour that, say a number of times saying we need yeah. to get round the table. Well, but what, what are you then going to say? But do you know no, why no, but you hang say on. that? But what are you actually going to say? Because you're going to have to offer something. We're going to have to negotiate, and we do not negotiate live on a TV programme. But do you know there was not a single strike in the NHS so hang during on. all of the years of the last Labour government from 97 to 2010? And why? Because we kept talking in good times and bad. We kept talking when things seemed like they might actually be fine. So when so it comes to good these strikes, hang on, forgive yes. me for interrupting. When it comes to these strikes, what you, you're asking people to believe is, we'll get round the table, we'll solve it somehow, but we won't tell you how. Well, do you know what? If they leave it until after the next general election, that could be another year. I mean, really, are we really saying that the Tories think it's OK just to hand this on to whoever wins the next general election? If it's us, of course we'll get round the table. We have no idea what they're going to do the, to the economy in the meantime. Liz Truss crashed the economy last year. What are they going to do in the next 12 months? So, of course, I can't tell you what we're going to do, but I think it's unforgivable that they may even be considering just going, do you know what, we'll leave it to someone else. And that's certainly what it looks like. And I think doctors and all our healthcare workers deserve a hell of a lot better than that. Well, our doctors should be looking after patients, not stood on picket lines. The, uh, there has been 900,000 cancelled appointments across the NHS, and it is absolutely unacceptable. What the government has done, it said it will stand by the independent pay body recommendations for junior doctors. That's an 8.8% increase. That's the average salary for a junior doctor is £55,000. For a consultant, the average is £130,000. Um, we absolutely need these doctors back in the health service. It's, I think it's unacceptable that uh, they can put people's uh, safety, people's lives at risk in terms of not being 
in the hospitals that where they're paid to be. So how are you going to do it? That's the, the thing, because they've been on, they keep going on strike and the BMA is saying it might go on strike indefinitely. Okay. How, how are you going to resolve this? We've already legislated. There's something called the Minimum Service Level Bill, which is opposed by Labour, which requires, um, where we specify it, it requires certain parts of the economy, such as our train drivers, such as our healthcare workers, and we're consulting on that now, to put in place a minimum number of people to look after the patients in those hospitals. Do do that. And that's exactly what we are doing. Do do so it will make a massive that difference. Already. They do that in France. They do that in Italy. They do it already. But that won't just do, do that. Why are they there now then? Yes. Why and what the problem now, here? The time? problem here is because the health secretary is not talking to them. Yes. It's months and months. Thirty-five percent pay months. increase. They're asking for. And how are you going to solve it? Is that what you settle it at? How are you going to solve it if you don't talk to them? We have talked to them all the time. That, no. that process it's continues. Just not the We've case. settled other disputes through negotiation. But how would you close a gap between eight point eight percent and thirty-five percent? So what, where, where, where would you Kevin, negotiate to? And, and you would what, not negotiate 17, live 18%? on TV. That's not how you negotiate, yeah. and you know that. You need to talk to doctors yes, in order to negotiate with settled. them. It was months ago that the Secretary of State last spoke to them, and the Prime Minister never has. Go and talk to them. Go and appreciate what they do, and then say, yes, there may be tough questions. So we high may have difficult times ahead, but we have to do this by talking to each other. And you're not doing that. You are letting down pensions. And, and Kevin's you question. You are letting you down Kevin's question. Your government is letting... You can't put a figure out of thin air in the middle of a TV programme. That's not a good way to negotiate. But you it say will you be go disrespectful high. to the taxpayer, it will be disrespectful yeah, to the right. doctors, but most of all, it will be disrespectful to the patients who are waiting okay. for you to sort this out so that they can get treated. We are just going back and forth and I feel we're not really getting anywhere. Let's hear from our audience. The woman there, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a nurse. Um, oh, I voted, well, let's hear what you think about it. I voted strike in the last ballot. When I'm balloted again, I will vote strike again and I'll do that continually until pay talks open and they're realistic. We are striking for pay. We are striking because we feel undervalued, but we're also striking for patient safety. So when we're accused of putting patients at risk, I say patients are at risk every single day of the week. We've got 7 million people on waiting lists. We've got 140,000 vacancies. People are dying on waiting lists. People are dying in the back of ambulances, and this cannot go on. The government need to get real and address the situation. And are you convinced by what you're hearing from, from either party here? As for the minimum minimal service levels bill, what I say to that is unions on strike days, they put in minimal service levels already. This is nothing new. And I would say we welcome the government saying we want minimal staffing, but we want minimal staffing every single day of the week. I've worked in the NHS for almost 20 years. I did shifts nearly 15 years ago that were 27 hours long because there was no nurses to take over because we were so short-staffed. Now, that was nearly 15 years ago, and here we are now with the government talking about minimal service levels. Mm. Frankly, that is an insult to us okay. all. Let, let, no, let's hear it from the Uh, yeah, uh, I'm ex-forces and I spent 22 years in the army and we could never strike because we were there to save lives and to make sure people were safe. The police are in the same boat. They're not allowed to strike because that would put lives in danger. So I think doctors and consultants should not be allowed to strike because okay. they're putting lives in danger. Matthew. Well, I genuinely think that the pay demands, particularly of the senior consultants, is wholly irresponsible. Have not people in the private sector taken real terms pay cuts during this cost of living crisis? Other public sector workers are much more sympathetic to, to the nurses. Um, but I do think that one of the reasons that people admire doctors and are, and are reasonably sympathetic to what they're doing is why we need a wider conversation about the National Health Service. Not the people who work on it, but about the system. Uh, we talk about our NHS, a world-beating NHS. Do you remember during the pandemic where it said, protect the NHS? Wasn't the NHS supposed to be protecting us? But the question, Matthew, that, the question uh, Matthew, is what should the winner of the next general election do differently to resolve the doctor's pay I, I, specifically? My, my own view is the government needs to hold out and I think the public will have more sympathy if we stop deifying the NHS. It should not be a national religion. It is the organisation that provides health services to us. It is not the best in the world. It has problems. It has, look at the maternity scandals that recur with depressing frequency. 
I think we need to be intellectually honest rather than emotionally attached to a system that is not working as well as it could be. And I think that will add backbone to what I think is the right decision by the government to stand up to consultants who are earning 130 odd thousand pounds more than most people in comparable countries. And I think it's disingenuous to say we get in a room and suddenly it's all going to be sorted out. I suspect that will not happen. It needs a bit of backbone from the government. And on this, I think the government is correct. OK, let's hear from these, the two women. The woman there in the blue sweater, yeah. I don't think our doctors and nurses and our healthcare professionals would actually be on strike unless there was a valid reason. And I think that valid reason is that the government won't negotiate. OK, and the woman next to you, you, you had your hand up as well. Um, I think there's quite a dangerous um, dichotomy between what Matthew's saying about people deifying the NHS and what Kevin is doing, which is villainising people who work in medical services. You're putting people's lives at risk because you want to be paid more and that's appalling. It's all politicised. During the pandemic, we were clapping these people so they felt like they had to go into hospitals, put themselves in dangerous situations where they were contracting COVID, dying of COVID. And now, suddenly, they actually want to be appreciated for the work they're doing above banging pots and pans, so they're being villainised for it. These people are some of the most highly qualified, most compassionate, hardest working people in our society. And for you to sit there and villainise them because they want more money for the job they do, I think is appalling. And let's see, I'll, I'll let you answer. Let me just stand here in the front. Yeah. When, it, when it comes to the NHS, you, you, you demonise it the doctors and the nurses who are going on strike. They are striking for patient safety. The majority of the NHS has been flogged off to the private sector. When the private sector get their hands on it, they cream off the top, subcontract out to others, and that's why the NHS is in such a bad state. Yeah. They need to take their force <laughs> off our NHS. <laughs> and the whole thing... The people at the bottom, disabled people, we are the ones who are suffering. We support the nurses, we support the doctors, we support the consultants, because without them, we are finished. I will not be able to afford my medications if it all goes private. OK, well, uh, OK. Thank you for your point, sir. Yes, Ella. Uh, I think I'm the only person on this panel that can very openly say I support the strikes. Um, I, th I think I was on the programme last time when it was the nurses and I said the very same. It seems to me a no-brainer that you make sure that the staff within an institution like the NHS don't just feel good, don't just feel like they are appreciated, whatever the hell that means, but are paid properly that have the right kind of um, income for the work that they're doing. And, you know, there's, I, I hate this row about you negotiate, no, you negotiate, you talk. Come out and say what your position is. You don't have to put a percentage point on it. You don't have to put a number on it. Do you support the idea that a worker is a worker and resist all of this kind of, I'm sorry, Kevin, but emotional blackmail that gets put on NHS workers about the idea that you're killing people if you're putting if you're going on strike. And, you know, the government's solution to it, again, you have this waffle from politicians about how they care about the cost of living crisis and whatever else. And then when it comes down to workers getting on a picket line and saying, here are the facts, here is the situation of my quality of life and it's not matching up with what I'm getting paid, what are you going to do about it? The government cripples workers' rights by instituting minimum services, by flirting with the idea of essentially by the back door banning strikes. I think that's appalling and should be resisted. But I also want to see something more substantial from if the opposition thinks it's got a chance in 2024. I don't, you know, everybody knows you can hide behind the, you know, it's very clever to say I won't negotiate on television thing. I don't think anyone's suggesting that you should put forward a figure. But does the Labour Party, the party of the people, the party of the working people, whatever you want to call it, do they support working people? Do you, are you in favour of giving, of meeting in any way, shape or form the demand of workers or are you just going to pontificate by saying we'll talk to them? As it happens, they don't want to be talked to, they want their demands so met. One of the first things we're going to do if we win the next general election is bring in an employment act that will actually strengthen workers' rights, strengthen unions' ability to negotiate with employers but also we're going to bring in an NHS workforce plan because I think we're ignoring the nurse's point here which is the NHS is understaffed on non-strike days and has been for years. When I first got into Parliament, I raised that 
We, yes, that's part of the employment bill that Angie Rayner, as our employment spokesperson, will be bringing in in the first 100 days of a Labour government, if we win the next general election, okay. to strengthen the ability to negotiate, to strengthen union rights, to undo some of the damage that Tory governments have done. But the NHS workforce plan is part of that, because that's why okay. the nurse here has had to stay over hours for so many times. But we let, need let's... to address that as well. I, I, oh. need, I need to... I need to you, you... Hang on, Matthew. I need to allow Kevin yeah, to address please. some of the points that were made. Uh, f from the back, very powerfully, that okay. you are vilifying uh, staff uh, in the uh, NHS. That's absolutely not what I said. What I said is uh, where doctors are, uh, and uh, um, junior doctors well, and consultants should, they they should be in uh, looking after patients, not on picket lines. That's what I said. In terms of minimum service levels, do not is not banning striking. You have minimum service levels in France, in Italy, in Spain, Australia, the USA, right. including ban on blue light ser uh, services. Make it right. Um, we're not an outlier, though, Ella. I think the point, the nurse, I don't, sorry, I don't know your name, and there are many, many fantastic people who work in the NHS, nurses, doctors, there's no way in the world I am villainising what you do. It, but I understand that the services are under massive pressure, despite the fact there are almost 300,000 more doctors and nurses in, working in the NHS today than there were in 2010. We're the third highest at household level in terms of funding of the NHS in Europe. There is and we have record waiting lists, as There has not been an increase know, since Kevin. 2010, the percentage of services provided by okay. private Kevin, contractors. Kevin, I want to get a little bit it more audience It is demand in. that's causing the problem, and it will be a, a, an issue for many years to man come. man there in the glasses. Yes, you, sir, with the blue shirt. Yes. Oh, thank Hi. Um, thank you. The least the government can do is to reach out to the team who are striking. I think that's a basic responsibility. And... Secondly, they can do is to come up with the right fact. They shouldn't come up with the figures like junior doctor will earn 55 and consultants earn 130. You know that's not right fact. And thirdly, the average. they should do is to say that it, the overall consultant body has increased. According to the government figures, there is more than 8,000 consultant posts vacant currently. Mm. And what they can do is to bring real facts to the people. From 2010 till 2022, this is a jointly published fact from BBC, NHS, FT. Matthew might be aware of it. Effectively, consultants are the worst hit group. 22% cut in the pay in the last 13 years. And if you don't want to see other facts, I don't want to bore you all, but one in three junior doctors have voted to step out of UK once they are qualified. Why do you think that's the case? When there are so many doctors voting quite literally from the feet, I think it's high time for government to really think. I mean, we can sit here and blame or point fingers, that's a bit lazy, as I might say. Oh, why are they striking? Why shouldn't they saving? Because you're not reaching out to listen to them. Okay. We are going to have to give you the final word, sir. <laughs> I'm afraid I know you want to come back in, but I'm afraid we are out of time. Thank you for your point, very powerfully made. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the panel. Uh, tonight. Thank you to all of you for coming along here to Ipswich tonight. Of course, thank you at home for watching. And I have to say thank you to the people who submitted these pictures, who are Ivan Ambrose, Alex Kutcher, I hope I pronounced that right, and Emmeline Berry. Remember, if you can't stay up late, we are on iPlayer live at 8 o'clock every Thursday. Otherwise, of course, we're on after 10 o'clock news. Thank you very much indeed. We will see you in sale next week from all of us here in Ipswich. Bye-bye. Mum, have you got the tickets?